The ideas and information explored in this webinar are featured in Collaboration, Co-Teaching, and Coaching in Gifted Education by Emily Mofield and Vicki Phelps, available from proofrock.com. So let me, let me introduce our two speakers. The first speaker I want to introduce is Emily Mofield. Emily is a, an old friend. She's a, an assistant professor of, at the College of Education at Lipscomb University. She has co-authored uh, many award-winning books that we have published. And uh, I'm going to, sorry, I'm just in my role of a salesperson. Let me, let me show you this. If you come over to the Proof Rock Press website, again, we're back to the website, and you just type in in the, the Proof Rock search over here, Mofield you will see a listing of all of the wonderful books that Emily has either co-authored uh, or, or um, uh, well, she's actually, she's someone who loves to collaborate. So all of her books are co-authored. Uh, she's done several books, but these are all of the books, curricular materials, as well as professional learning products that Emily has done uh, for us. She's a prolific writer, 15 years experience teaching uh, gifted students and leading gifted education services. She's a national board certified teacher in language arts. She's the past chair of the National Association for Gifted Children's Curriculum Studies Network. And she received the NAGC Hollingsworth Award uh, for excellence and gifted education research. So welcome, Emily. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. So happy to be here. Our other author is Vicki Phelps. Vicki is a lead consulting teacher for gifted education at Sumner County, uh, Tennessee. She is 20 years uh, in, in gifted education, both uh, leading services and as a, as a teacher. She's worked collaboratively to successfully develop a, uh, a, a, an open, a, ma a gifted magnet school. And she too is a national board certified teacher, but in mathematics. Uh, welcome Vicki, thank you for joining us. So happy to be here and welcome everybody. Can't wait to talk some more with you. Yeah, so let me let me pitch this to the both of you and uh, and it, whichever wants to pick it up, please do. Let me ask you the 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 key word that we're focused on today is this collaboration uh, and, and how we can collaborate with other teachers and other individuals so that we're bringing services to gifted students. But what do we mean by collaboration? What does that look like in the school context? You know, I think I'll jump in here. Um, really, when we think about collaboration, we're, we're thinking about our students are gifted all day, every day. And we know with more and more push-in services happening, it's even more important uh, for us all to come together, everybody that works with our students, to learn the best way that we can help support them. So this might mean pulling in the gifted education teacher, the classroom teacher, a school psychologist, possibly an ELL specialist, and let's not forget the parents and community members that we can also collaborate with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, and I'd like to just speak very, just, just a little bit about just the benefits that come along with collaboration. So, you know, when we have two people collaborating, we're, we're having capacity building happening. So, you know, the gifted ed teacher gets to not just share strategies, but develop capacity in that regular ed teacher to differentiate and to address needs of gifted learners. And it's really an awesome process. It's two people coming together as co-thinkers, co-constructing knowledge. Uh, and, you know, differentiation, we talk a lot about it, but it's really difficult to do if, as a classroom teacher. And so when you have another teacher coming in and partnering to do it, it makes it more manageable. Also, it allows us to really take advantage of the expertise of each teacher, especially if we're talking about the context of, in the classroom. Um, the gifted ed teacher really gets to um, take advantage of the content expertise of the classroom teacher. And then that gifted ed teacher can share how to bump things up you know, pull-out classrooms um, are an important part of many districts, and they, they have their place. There's enrichment there, but sometimes they're seen as isolated or disconnected where they're just off doing their own thing. And so if collaboration is added as a component, um, there can be a more direct link because, as we know, gifted ed students are not just gifted on the Thursdays that they go to pull out. And so there is a more direct link of, of services. Also, more students 
benefit. It's not just those identified gifted students. Um, it's if two teachers are working together in a classroom, like in co-teaching, um, multiple students will benefit from that high level um, instruction. And this also brings um, more opportunities for equitable identification. If the gifted ed teacher is collaborating or co-teaching with a regular ed teacher, um, it's more likely that gifted behaviors are going to be observed, are gonna be brought out um, through that instruction. So these are some of the many things we, we talk about in the book. So I, I'll tell you, one of my biases, uh, Emily, is that when, when this, when the, the prospectus, because this is how it works when, you know, at the publishing house, you, you, you get a prospectus and it's got the fleshed out content and everything. I was still, you know, I, intellectually, I know that gifted education has evolved since I was in the classroom 30 years ago. <laughs> but emotionally, I think, or, or conceptually, when I saw this pr prospectus, I thought, oh, I like back in the day when I had my gifted ed classes, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't particularly collaborate with anybody other than maybe some of the other gifted ed teachers when we did, you know, simulations or something with other classrooms. But I was still working in my mind with this model that the gifted programs mostly just are homogeneously grouped uh, classrooms or pull out programs. And then when I read your prospectus, I realized, oh, wow, what a dimwit. Like this, <laughs> this field has evolved such that we are quite often coming into general education and providing consulting and services and sometimes in the classroom or sometimes collaboratively with a teacher. Can, can you kind of talk about that evolution and why then as a result of that evolution, co this collaboration piece is so important? Yes, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you, I was I was originally in a district where this was a new model and it was like, oh, how are we going to do this? Why are we doing this? And so there's a couple of factors. You know, the standards have become more and more important and, you know, emphasizing content. Um, and so to making sure that we are really addressing what's going on in the classroom where students are exposed to advanced content, not just in pull up pull out, but all day, every day is the big factor. Another factor is just the, the model of talent development has really been in our field in the past nine or 10 years or so, especially where we're seeing giftedness as more dynamic. It's not that you're gifted or not, but we're really emphasizing more of like who might be gifted. And so it's, it's also about pulling out the potential or providing curriculum in the regular classroom and see who responds to it who where they may need more services even in, in maybe in pull out or direct services so the talent development model i think is really important to consider here as like okay we are not every kid is just gifted in everything and they're just going to go to this hodgepodge of things and pull out but they may be really get really gifted and talented in math and so how can the gifted ed teacher support the math teacher in developing math talent. So those are a couple of reasons. You know, I wanna jump in here real quick too, because I'm sure a lot of us can relate to uh, how distance learning is affecting um, our students right now. And just from my own personal experience, it even, we have less time really one-on-one -on -one with our students. We used to have them for a full class period every day. And in many situations, whether it's hybrid or full distance learning, we don't have that. So for our little snapshots of time when we get to know those students, think about if we could collaboratively come together with everybody else that works with that student and put all of those pieces of that puzzle together, we'll have a much better overall picture of how to better meet that student's needs. That makes that makes a, a great deal of sense. I, I, I would think though that as we're talking, I mean, it used to be, and I, I know it's changing and whatnot, but, but it used to be that all of us, even classroom teachers, there was kind of this sense of like, well, once you once you close that door, you know, you, you've got a lot of autonomy in that room. And, mm -hmm. and that's something that I think many of us enjoy. Uh, so it kind of leads me to the thinking of like, what are some of the barriers to getting folks to collaborate? Are there some uh, psychological barriers that like, I know I like, I like just being in my room and doing my own thing. Like what, what, what do you guys see as the, the barriers to getting this kind of interaction? You know, I, I think all of us can agree time. We never have enough time to be able to um, 
to get together the way that we would like to, to collaborate. Uh, what Emily and I have found is that by making these little, you know, pockets of time to collaborate, it actually streamlines so many things down the road and you save time on the back end by putting in some time, you know, and, and little spot checks along the way. Um, we also have to work on uh, addressing assumptions. There are still a lot of people that might say, you know, get your kids are going to be fine. We don't need to do anything for them. Um, but what the truth is, is that there are so many different um, issues that we need to address, whether it be asynchronous development or finding the appropriate level of challenge so that we don't create underachievers in the future because they've never needed to, to really have to apply themselves and work through that productive struggle uh, for success. So addressing these different assumptions um, is really important. Uh, just also, when we think back to a lot of the pre-service education that we have as teachers, there's not a great deal of emphasis on gifted education. So it's really hard to be aware of all of these strategies that are really founded on gifted pedagogy to be able to better meet the needs of the gifted learners. And then um, quite simply here at the, the end of this that you might see, collaboration alone may not be intensive enough. You had mentioned earlier, Joel, that you might have collaborated with the other gifted ed teachers when you were in the classroom, but we're finding that may not be enough. I mean, we really need to take that time to, to speak and collaborate with all of the stakeholders in that student's life or those students' lives to best meet their needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, to address um, some of these barriers. Let's see, the slides are not working. Hang on, it's not moving to the next slide. But um, we have learned a few lessons along the way in the district that we worked in uh, to address um, some of these barriers. And so uh, one of them is that everybody really needs to be on the page, on the same page of what's going on. And a key factor really needs to be that administrative support um, where there's an administrator who understands this idea who could help schedule cluster grouping so that this can you know really happen and also we are not advocating for pull out to be thrown out altogether um, and so collaboration we see this as a supplement to to even provide more intense services beyond just pull out so i do want to make that clear um, other other things that we've learned along the way to address some of these barriers um, are that everybody needs there needs to be structure clear roles clear responsibilities it's not that the go that the gifted ed teacher is coming in and like a know-it-all and here can i help you today <laughs> you know we are um when everyone is on the same page and they talk through those roles that can be very very helpful um, I want to see if I can change slides so I can refer to yeah, some yeah. of these. Here we go. Here we go. Um, and Emily, also, go ahead and start sharing the screen because I grabbed it back when, when that one slide got stuck. So if, if you'll share okay, screen again. Gotcha. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Also, we have to, like Vicki said, we have to plan to co-plan. And it doesn't always have to be a formal 30-minute planning meeting. It can be um, a, a, 10 to, a five to 10 minute meeting and where you prepare to cope, you, pre you do a few things before the meeting and a few things after the meeting. Um, of course, building relationship and trust is so key before you have someone coming in your own classroom. And we'll talk a little bit about that. You know, for some, okay, there we go. Also, we encourage, if collaboration is really gonna happen, it's really hard to collaborate with someone who doesn't want to collaborate. And so <laughs> we've learned this lesson. And so it's really important to work with the welcoming, those who are excited about this endeavor. Also, it's important that there's like a toolkit that's built where the gifted ed teacher isn't just coming in and doing these cool activities where things are exploding and, you know, lots of cool hands-on activities in the classroom, but it's true, uh, it's a true approach to differentiation. Um, there's that support there. Um, and to continually evaluate is, is push in working. Um, when is pull out better? When is push in better? So, and how can they work together? So those are some of the lessons we've learned along the way. 
That's great. I, I was thinking, uh, well, a couple of things I was thinking about. One of them is uh, for many years ago, I worked uh, on a Javits grant and we were, you know, creating a, a good bit of change in classrooms. And one of the first principles of that kind of uh, change is that you find the people who want to be there. You know, they're, they're, like you just, you need the willing uh, to participate in something like that. And the other thing that I was thinking that I love about the, your approach is this idea that there are kids who maybe on your old models of what is a gifted child wouldn't qualify for gifted services, mm -hmm. but they do have, a, let's say, a knack for mathematics. And we mm -hmm. could be serving that one kid in, 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 in a mathematics area, but they, they may not qualify for services in, in the rest of the school right. program. This really allows us to come in, collaborate with the math teachers so that they're getting special uh, services in, in the classroom with the resources that we can provide to that teacher. And we become a positive you know, helper both for the kid and for the, the teacher. And I, I think that's, you know, that's wonderfully powerful. Can you kind of talk a little bit about it from a, just a concrete level? What are the, the types of collaboration services that you're proposing? You know, collaboration in its greatest sense actually extends beyond the walls of the school. You know, you had mentioned a second ago about uh, a student that might be gifted in mathematics. Well, how about a student who might be gifted in art or or something that may not be a core academic, you know, content area class. I mean, think about the uh, collaborative partners you could pull in from the community. Um, that's, that's very powerful. In addition to working with the arts teachers there in, in the building. So, you know, the first thing when we think about collaboration is we're not confined to just the, the school walls that we're working within. We're really looking to anybody that can help um, better meet the needs of our gifted learners, no matter if it's in one subject, multiple subjects, whatever the case may be. Um, parents are also involved in that. I mean, who knows the students better than the parents? So really looking at them as collaborative partners as well. But regardless of if you're dealing with a, a parent or a community member or another um, educator within the building, there's basically four different types of collaborative practices that we talk about in the book. Uh, the first one being consulting. And in consulting, basically, the gifted education teacher or gifted specialist is providing guidance to another educator, um, helping them learn a little bit more about best practice in gifted education. Uh, Co-planning. Through co-planning, it's, it's two or more educators really working together on the development of lessons. So in this case, they might be tiering some lessons, working on flexible grouping, um, you know, uh, differentiation of different lessons, that type of thing. Then you move into co-teaching, which when done well is so powerful. And this is where two or more teachers are actually sharing the responsibility within a shared space to, to meet the needs of these gifted learners. They're both actively involved. You really can't tell who is the lead teacher and who's not because they're both so involved in the process. And we're gonna be able to talk about some of those. Um, I'm hoping, keeping my fingers crossed later in this, um, in this session. And then coaching is, is another collaborative practice where the focus is on improving the learning and teaching through uh, more of a guided reflection process. Um, so these are kind of in a nutshell, the different collaborative practices and how they might look with different collaborative partners. Mm -hmm. And then I'd like to share that, um, you know, co collaboration is truly co-laboring and co thinking. So, you know, back when I first started this endeavor, and even as a gifted ed teacher myself, you know, I used to share resources. I used to email teachers ideas and put little packets of using Scamper and six hats in people's mailboxes. And, you know, and I thought that's collaboration. Well, that's not really collaboration. That's me sharing a resource. But what we're wanting to do is move towards maybe after we share that resource, that's an invitation to co-labor with the teacher and really get to building capacity and helping them use those strategies. So we kind of see this as a spectrum, but sharing resources is just the beginning to true collaboration where we're co-planning, co-teaching, and then we have endeavors where we are team problem solving, um, perhaps with students who are twice exceptional 
or really thinking about you know broader program um, programs for sp students specific needs that makes sense emily thank you i i i would I, I would encourage though uh, you guys who are participants uh, uh the q a box is starting to fill up and we're about to get to a meaty part of the uh the discussion here and and so i i want you to please feel free to uh uh, pose questions as we're talking about w w the the next question that I'm going to pose, which really gets to sort of the meat of the book and some of the the the, the practices that uh, Emily and Vicky would recommend. I also want to mention before we move into this section, some of these suggestions are directly from you guys, but also you guys were drawing from a rich body of research about best practices in special education because you know special ed and ESL teachers have for years had to do this sort of thing. So you were you were looking at what was out there and, and watching how it would work in gifted education and impl practicing that in, in, in gifted education programs. Uh, but I but this is a, a this comes from a broad uh, a body of, of information. Can, can you talk about some of those key factors that make collaboration work, some of the strategies that, that make it work? You know, it's interesting you brought this up because we we did a lot of research. We read um, so many articles and resources that um, are out there. And like you said, we pulled from different areas as well, not just gifted education to learn. And as we synthesized that information, we, we came away with kind of in a nutshell, what we believe is the foundation of what's going to help collaboration work. And the first thing we, we talk about is team, the importance of team. And that is, you know, building the trust between the collaborative partners you have to give trust to get trust back a little bit. Um, really creating that environment the same way that we strive to do with our students, that environment for risk taking and being honest uh, with each other is so important. Um, also the E, engaging each other's expertise. Uh, Dr. Mofield, she had referenced earlier, I mean, let's, let's learn from each other. We have content area specialists out there um, as a gifted specialist, we might know a little bit about multiple different areas, but we have so much to learn from our classroom teachers and their content specialty. So really engaging and respecting that expertise from each other, the, the A of team, aligning beliefs and values. I mean, if we're going to be if we're going to be co-teaching with somebody, we need to to kind of talk through well, what are expectations for student discipline? How are we going to, um, you know, what what is your your style in the classroom, you know, aligning what is going to work and focusing on the and approach instead of the or approach. And then M, maintain the relationship. I think just on a personal level, uh, writing this book was um, such a joy to work with Emily because we embraced this team frame and having this maintained the multiple times throughout the writing process just being able to touch base and see what's working, what's not working, what do we need to add, all that good kind of stuff. But within this team frame, we then continue to use that research that we, we had learned about to create what we call the collaborative process model. And you'll notice around the outside, it literally is a frame of team. And then within that, we have the collaborative process model, which is based on a constructivist approach where we're constructing new knowledge and we're valuing the expertise of different people. And basically we are setting that purpose or the goal for collaboration. Then we are working on the plan of how are we going to bring this to fruition? How are we going to make this work? And then we're having that integral piece of reflection. What is working? What's not working? And the great thing about this, while, while team is on the outside and we've got the, the collaborative process model working there in the middle, in the very center, we have that shared understanding, which is really, we're all on the same page, working to, to really meet the needs of what's best for our students. And so, um, you know, so much of what we're talking about, we're talking about personal relationships and real people have real feelings. And you know, the thing is like teachers were all nice to each other, but like sometimes like things just get on our nerves or, you, you know, we're afraid to like share, you know, this is my space. What are you doing coming in here? And um, what am I doing wrong? Am I, like, like, you know, so it's like, it's so important to 
think through interpersonal relationships. Now, because we all need another acronym in our lives, we have another one um, <laughs> that we include in the book. Um, it's the SCARF model, um, but I love this one. This is David Rock, and this, this works with collaboration, but it works with any aspect of anyone's life. This is like a human nature kind of thing. And so if we, if we keep in mind these things as we're working with another person and, and think about how these are either threats or enhancers to a relationship, it can really move us forward. So the first part is status. And so we've really got to make sure that the, the classroom teacher doesn't feel under the gifted ed teacher. The gifted ed teacher isn't coming in as the hero to save the day and let me help you differentiate. Um, so we want to make sure that each person feels valued. Um, the certainty piece is built in through understanding this is my role. I'm not coming in here to tell you what to do. We're here to co-think together where there's certainty about what's actually happening. There's autonomy. Um, the te teachers still have decisions on what's going to happen through this decision-making process. Um, we've got to show each other that we truly care about each other through relatedness and that everything is going um, in a fair manner. So I love the SCARF model. There's a whole lot more to this, but the, these are definitely um, things to keep in mind. And so as we um, work with that certainty, we have things throughout the book like, well, what would be the role of the gifted ed teacher? What would be the role of the classroom teacher? And what would their shared roles be? And, um, you know, these are just examples, but, you know, we'd want, we'd want eventually for um, the classroom teacher to learn a lot of these roles from the gifted ed teacher. Um, you know, while initially it may be the gifted ed teacher like coming up with some higher order thinking questions that could be used in instruction, we eventually want that to be also the role of the classroom teacher. So this builds in certainty. Another thing we feel like is really important is to make assumptions explicit. We're all walking around with stories in our head or, or what we think, you know, is just common sense to us. But it's really important to just nail down, have a conversation with teachers we're working with at the beginning. You know, how, what are your beliefs about gifted learners and what are your beliefs about grading? And, you know, what's your idea about co-planning? And do you think we're going to do this once a week? Um, you know, set it have a conversation about what these assumptions are. You know, I wanted to add in too, when, when you're working with people, we also talk about something called presuming positive intent. And I will tell you for me, this was such a huge piece of learning that has totally changed my practice. I've always um, wanted to communicate effectively, but the more that I've learned about collaboration, the more I realize, wow, I was doing some things that maybe weren't the best, right? So presuming positive intent really comes back to that S of SCARF, the status. We wanna make sure that everybody feels respected. So when we are in, you know, asking questions and, and working collaboratively with people, we wanna make sure that we are asking questions that are coming from a place where we are respecting that person, that they are trying to do what's best for the student, right? So instead of starting questions with like, well, have you, have, have you tried differentiation for your gifted learners? Or do, do you think flexible grouping might work here? Those are those yes or no questions that at times, even though we could be saying it with a warm and loving heart, it still could come across like, well, of course I've tried that type of a thing. So think about how much more powerful it is instead of saying, um, yeah, have you tried differentiation? Maybe you could say, what types of differentiation strategies have you tried so far with your gifted learners? That opens up the conversation to where the, the collaborative partner can say, oh, well, I've been working with, you know, the, with Scamper or with depth and complexity or whatever it is that they happen to be working with. And if they aren't sure how to answer that question because you've kind of put it out there for them on what types have you been using, they might come back and say, you know what? I haven't really thought about that. Are, are there specific strategies I should be using? Which then totally opens up the conversation and creates you know, even more meaningful collaboration. So 
So when, when my wife says, did you mean to leave the empty soda can on the counter? <laughs> then I can give her this, this slide as perhaps some recommendations for how that could be rephrased. <laughs> <laughs> so, but because obviously you are also just these are these are the skills that we have as we're working with other people, and that 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 makes a great deal of sense. Um, we're 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 starting to be pressed for time a little bit, so if if I accelerate things a little bit, I I uh, I don't mean to rush you guys. Please take your time. Um, I I there was a section in the book that I thought was really great, was uh, that where it was sort of instructional strategies that we can as gifted education uh, uh, professionals be sharing with the general education teachers. Uh, and I, could you talk a little bit about some of those things that you, you hit in the book? Yes, yes. So um, one part of the book, we, we talk about this idea of demonstration teaching or modeling. And so um, this is when the gifted ed teacher might go in and before you do co-teaching or anything, you know, the, the gifted ed teacher will model a strategy. And so we have, we have a resource in the book that um, we have where the regular ed teacher could watch for some of these specific next level questioning or engagement strategies and observe um, how, how the gifted ed teacher teaches that. And we felt like this is important because in our in, well, in my personal experience, there, there were times like that I would go in and model a lesson, but the teacher would leave to make copies or, you know, do something and, and kind of miss it. And, you know, and, but that's a reflection because we weren't on the same page of what I was actually doing. And, you know, that's why assumptions need to be made explicit. But there are several resources in the book like this that, okay, this is a tool that we can use so you can see some of these strategies. And we use this model, um, ABCs for differentiation, advanced content, building in the buy-in, that motivation, and we're creating a challenge. And you know, this is kind of an overview of the strategies. And we have things like step the Kaplan step the complexity, Paul's reasoning, um, some of these metaphorical thinking or the popular six hats. Um, and so I'll, I'm gonna pass it over to Vicki to talk a little bit more about that. Right, so um, just as Emily had just said, we actually have two full chapters in the book where we share a multitude of strategies and with each strategy, we actually frame them within examples of practice. So you can kind of see how they would be implemented through a collaborative approach. But the, the first chapter that's focused on strategies are really strategies that are easily integrated into already existing lessons. So those ones that we kind of keep mentioning over and over, the scamper and the Kaplan's depth and complexity, um, Paul's reasoning, um, st stretch prompts, which um, Emily is really working on developing more and, and super exciting. And so there's these really great strategies that are very easily integrated. But then we've also included a chapter that's full of strategies that are focused more from the onset of lesson development. These are when you are really um, working from the beginning of lesson development collaboratively with somebody and they, they work off more of the concept attainment, inductive reasoning type things, um, mystery box, some, some more from the, you know, from the very get go of lesson development. Thank you, I appreciate that, Vicki. Um, let, let me get you guys to, because we're all in this weird thing. I mean, as you, all the audience, so you can tell we're all working from home in many cases, and and uh, and we're doing this webinar from home, and uh, so that kind of changes this whole collaboration piece a little bit, and puts some pressures in different different places. What what is co? I'm I'm coming back to the co-teaching idea. Once we get to that level, what does that look like in an online environment? What what, what are your thoughts about that? Mm -hmm. Yes, so co-teaching, um, we'll just share a little bit about first what we learned about co-teaching in general and how and how we see it at, um, at work here in today's world. But, you know, we borrowed a lot from what we already know from friend and cook. There's um, team teaching and, and one teach and one observe. And so we'll talk a little bit about what we think these look like. So I'll pass it over to Vicki. So um, this is a, so much fun to talk about here. So We've kind of reframed uh, frame, uh, Friend and Cook's co-teaching uh, models here to really signify what they would look like in gifted education. And ultimately for, for right now, also talking about how is this gonna look during hybrid distance learning 
uh, right now. So Tango Teaching, the two teachers are working together. They're, you know, going back and forth on who's asking the questions. They're both equally contributing. They're eliciting responses. So in a classroom, that's pretty straightforward. Right now, if, if we're in distance learning, hybrid learning, it might mean that both teachers, kind of the same way we are on this webinar right now, mm -hmm. it could be that both teachers are right there. We're both jumping in. We're both asking questions. We're eliciting responses from the students. It also uh, could be just even thinking about how we're planning for the lesson, if it is an independent piece of work for the student at home, that both teachers are actively working behind the scenes, I guess you could say, to, to plan for what those independent moments of learning would look like. We also have tier teaching, which if you think about tiered assignments, here we have two different groups based on readiness, student readiness levels, and how are we going to meet their needs? So they're focused on the same concept, but based on their needs, one of the groups is going to be working on something that might be a, a bit more challenging. Now, this does not mean that neither, you know, one of the groups isn't going to have high level questioning. Both groups are going to be engaged, have high level questioning. It's just that level of rigor is going to be kind of bumped up for the, for the students that have demonstrated that they need that. So they're both receiving those, those high level questions throughout. What this could look like if you are working through an online Zoom meeting is that you start out as a class and then you go into breakout rooms and one teacher takes one breakout room and the other teacher takes the other breakout room. You can talk about things and then you can come back together even at the end for reflection because you're both still might be working off the same story or article that you've read or math concept. So that's how tier teaching might work. Carousel teaching is one of my favorite because it just provides such a visual for me. When we think about station teaching, you, you know, you can kind of picture that students are moving from station to station, but with carousel teaching, we're also acknowledging that we need to differentiate up or down depending on the student's needs, which we, we call vertical differentiation. So in a distance learning model, this might mean that um, there are going to be stations where students are working independently. And there are going to be a, the station for one teacher and a different station for another teacher within a distance, you know, virtual means it could be that students are provided with, you know, independent worm, worm work in the main uh, room, but then as they're pulled into the next station with each teacher they're able to, you know, have that experience with that vertical differentiation provided as well. And I'll quickly go over these last bit, this last bit. So um, we have what we call scout and stretch teaching. This is the version for one assist or one support um, with friend and cook. But this is basically when one teacher teaches, the other teacher might step in and, and then follow up with an even more challenging question. So there's that stretch teaching or the other teacher is watching for who's responding, who's really showing some creative uh, talent here. And so we're, we're scouting. And you know, and this can happen um, through Zoom online meetings or the gifted ed teacher reviewing work and still being able to spot students who are really uh, rising. Um, and then we have what we call safari teaching, which is Frid and Cook's alternative teaching. This is when you might have a small group who has already mastered the content. And so they are really doing something very different. Um, it could, there, it's an extension to the curriculum. And so um, I can see this happening in breakout rooms or special independent assignments that students would do. It's still connected to the curriculum, but it's, it's, it's not just tiered assignments where there's just a few things different. It really is a, a different activity for students. And so throughout the book, we have planning planning modules or planning guides um, where there's like, okay, how are we going to pre-assess? How are we going to group students? What co-teaching approaches are we going to use? And so even with an online model, um, you know, you may could brainstorm what breakout rooms um, you might use or how this might look with Google Classroom assignments. 
Thanks, Emily. I, I appreciate it. I, look, before uh, we move into the Q &A, uh, and A, and again, if you haven't visited the Q and A, please please go in there and upvote questions and add any questions that you might have. Uh, let me ask you about one last piece. I, I've as I've watched my own younger kids. I've got a, a, a four-year-old and a seven-year-old here at the house, and we're we're doing you know we're online learning completely and and the amount of engagement that uh well i mean let's face it, it's my wife i mean i'm, I'm up here doing <laughs> webinars you know but but i mean she is doing an incredible amount of work with the kids and i and i imagine that suddenly parents in this kind of online environment they they become a collaborator but they're also a, a crazy important collaborator in this online they're always important but it, even more so in this online world talk a little bit about your thoughts about collaborating with parents you know, I think in the past, um, quite often, our main goal is to communicate with parents, which is very important. But m now more than ever, we need to really bridge from communication to collaboration. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, it might begin by just in those initial forms of communication that we're using inclusive language with, alongside, you know, involve, you know, those types of of words as we communicate, but ultimately, we also need to um, ask ask the parents how you know how the students are doing. I know that parents are reaching out saying, "I you know he is really struggling with this. This is not working, or this is working. Thank you for doing this." We need to really focus on the strength based approach for our students. So if we can hear from the parents what is working well and what is maybe not working as well, then as educators, we can try to recreate those moments where it's really working well as often as possible. Um, I also think it's really important to recognize parents as great resources within learning itself. So finding out if, if they have a special skill or a content area specialization that they might want to share, I mean, Think about how exciting that is to pull in guest speakers. I mean, you know, we can we see each other all the time with our Zoom faces, right? But to have some a different person on, wait, this is going to be way cool. So I think there's a lot to be said to really be purposeful and stretching beyond that communication piece, which is very important, but really moving to that collaborative piece to make sure that we're enriching the learning for our students. Vicki Vicky just explained that so well, and I would just emphasize that so many of these other principles like SCARF, like, um, you know, the status here is like, we're seeing parents as a co-thinker even with us as we consider their strengths. And there's, we've got a plan for certainty or, you know, where parents understand, okay, every day, this is how it's going to look on Google Classroom, and these are the clear expectations. Um, and so following a lot of these same interpersonal principles are all, also go a long way. And now let me let me turn this over to uh, Stephanie. Stephanie is going to be handling the Q&A. We've got plenty of questions in the Q&A box. Thank you for your active participation in that. And uh, we'll let, let, uh, let Stephanie take over. All right. Thanks, Joel. Uh, so the main question we got was about online learning. So I know you guys talked a little bit about that, but do you have any other tips for for working with collaboration in an online learning environment, either while you're teaching or during the planning phase? Sure. Yeah, can I, I'll speak to the planning phase just a little bit. So, um, you know, even when we were writing this book, which our, our book was due like April 1st, so like, you know, we were like in the, we had no idea really what these long-term implications would be um, as we were writing, but even when we were writing, we were we, we did include some things about just virtual planning. So, you know, a, a classroom teacher can share a lesson plan through email or Google Docs and and then the gifted ed teacher can go in and see what those standards are and see what the goals are. And, you know, without even personally communicating can offer suggestions for differentiation. So, you know, that that was something that we had already planned for. So, um, but we do suggest, you know, even to save time, even in real world, that lesson plans are shared um, in that way. And then you can have a five to 10 minute real conversation about it. Um, so that's one tip. I would also jump in and say, we, we talk in the book about the importance, and Emily had referenced this earlier, the importance of having clear um, expectations and roles for what each 
uh, contributing member to the collaborative team is going to be responsible for. So, you know, in the, the beginning stages of collaboration to say, I'm going to, you know, take the lead on this and I'm going to take the lead on this. And then just as she was saying, having that shared, whether it's a Google Doc or whatever, where you can put in comments and ideas. Maybe one person says, you know what, I'm going to find a video on this to support, you know, how they're going to compare it to X, Y, and Z, whatever the case may be. So kind of divide and conquer as much as possible. Within the Google Classroom setting or a Zoom meeting, that type of thing, um, I, just being honest, I'm, I'm kind of in the trenches of it right now. Um, just try and chisel out, you know, five minutes to try and just practice through it so that you are able to share a screen easily between two people that you are able to integrate in, you know, my, my favorite thing right now is, you know, bringing in some extra manipulatives. So like flippity.net has a great um, resource for that. So practice integrating in some nuances uh, with each other. Uh, before you pull the students in, even if it's just for five minutes, so that when the students are there, it's more streamlined and, and it goes a bit smoother. Great, that's super helpful. Um, our next question, uh, how can those of us who are sole practitioners manage the collaboration when we have, say, 35 different classrooms to work with? What would you prioritize? That's, that is very difficult and that is almost impossible. <laughs> I mean, I, I see that as a system issue, not something that you can really do as an individual. And so that's not best practice to, I mean, it's, it, it would re, I think that just requires a whole system shift. Um, however, you know, there are still opportunities to collaborate, but I, I think you do have to work within the model that your school district has and um, and just look for opportunities. Um, I don't think you can do pull out and push in with, with that many schools. Um, right, and I, I would jump in and say, I, I think there are a lot of areas where you're, you're not alone. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's going on in, in quite a few places. So um, as Emily had referenced earlier, work with the welcoming so you know you, you're not going to be able to get to every single teacher that's just that's you have to acknowledge that and give yourself grace with that but find those teachers who are ready and the more that you work with those teachers they're going to start sharing with their friends so it might be that you're working with this one but then they might share an idea that you shared with that one that the next person might hear about and start working with or also come to you. And it might be then that you end up working with a group of them at one time, just to kind of talk about quickly, here's a strategy and how might it look in your different content areas. Yeah, and we've done that um, in the district. We've we both came from this work in this have worked in the same district. So, you know, even in PLC groups before school and after school, it may not be collaboration looks like you're co planning or co teaching, but maybe you're starting with that first part of sharing resources. Um, and then maybe you could go in and demonstrate uh, a strategy. Um, or even, even share a strategy at a faculty meeting, whether it's in person or a Zoom faculty meeting, you could still you know, demonstrate how that might look within a certain content area. And each teacher there could say like, oh, light bulb, this is how I could use it in my classroom. Exactly. Great. Um, we also had a question about um, the idea of talent development. Could you elaborate a little more on what that looks like uh, in the gifted classroom? Yeah, so um, talent development is a, is a model for thinking about giftedness as a very malleable construct that we don't know someone has talent like until they're exposed to the opportunity to use it like you don't know if you're a good volleyball player so you play volleyball right or if you can sing until you're exposed to a few singing lessons like you, you talent comes out and so what we mean is like if we provide students with the opportunity to learn high level math or to be creative problem solvers or creative writers and we see it emerge 
then we spot that talent and then we do what we can to put them on this trajectory towards expertise in that area. So if we, if we see, ooh, you're showing some strength in that area, um, I'm going to provide some differentiated tasks so that you can continue to demonstrate that strength. And so this is a little bit different than the traditional view of giftedness, where it's like, ooh, you've got this cutoff score or you don't, um, or we're going to meet your needs for giftedness. That's the traditional view. The talent development is we see this strength and we're going to do what we can to give context to grow that strength. And so there's a little more emphasis on that very specific domain of math or writing to grow that specific talent. And, I can't uh, add anything to that. That was perfect. <laughs> yeah, Brandy, I'll take a minute to, that, the, the question was, Brandy, I'll take a minute to mention this book, Talent Development as a Framework for Gifted Education. This is uh, uh, Paulo Ojewski Kubilius and Rena Sabotnik and Frank Wuerl mm -hmm. uh, have done this book. And it's kind of, it's kind of the, um, it, it's a professional learning piece that looks at the broad picture. We, we've got some other books coming out in, in the pipe that, that will be, um, uh, very hands-on uh, kind of uh, kind of not necessarily frameworks, but actual implementation examples and things like that, and, and program models. But this is sort of the, the the book right now on talent development, and it, it, the the talent development piece is so important because it gives us an opportunity to. Well, let me let me break from what I was about to say. This all goes back to Joe Renzulli when he was first talking about you know the school-wide enrichment model. We're exposing mm -hmm. kids to all kinds of of opportunities, and then we're looking for the ones that uh, really caught up to certain certain activities and 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 do perform very well and then suddenly we're identifying talent areas and 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 but that framework book really sort of expresses that in a modern school setting and, and how that uh, that would look so sorry for inter interjection i just wanted to mention that resource it's a good one wonderful yes mm -hmm. yeah super helpful um we also had a question about um the lack of GT training for pre-service teachers. So as a GT community, how can we lobby the teacher training programs to include more high quality GT information into their programs? Is it okay if I jump in on this one? Sure, yeah, please. <laughs> so there's, there's a couple of things here. I mean, first and foremost, really getting in touch with those advocacy groups, um, you know, whether it be your state gifted organization, uh, your NAGC, um, the, the World Council, you know, gifted uh, group that, that's also very valuable. Um, but even within the book, um, we talk about how to work with those advocacy groups and how as, as an individual in a building, how you can um, elicit change in that regard. We also talk about even with the teachers and the, the people that you'll be collaborating with, collaborating with how you can use um, third points to help raise their awareness. So mm -hmm. for instance, you could pull in the NAGC programming standards mm -hmm. and elicit a conversation about, you know, which of these components do you see uh, aligning most with the standards that you're teaching in your classroom? That's using that presuming positive intent and a way for them to begin to make those connections to what they're doing in their classroom. So there's a lot of ways that, that we talk about. I wish we had more time to talk more in depth about it, but we, we do address uh, how to get involved with the advocacy groups, as well as how to raise that level of understanding within your buildings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that does seem like it's, that's such a, a systemic issue, and 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 the mm -hmm. advocacy groups are so important in in in, in all of this. But I, I, you're changing perceptions and making sure that we that you're included as part of the conversation. Those pre-service programs, yes. uh, Stephanie, we're running short on time. Maybe maybe one more question, and then and then we'll need to wrap up. Yeah, sure thing. Um, we had a few people interested in hearing about. Um, can you advise on creating a differentiation toolkit? Um, and I wasn't sure if that question came from something you mentioned earlier or. Yeah, so that was in our lessons learned. And so, you know, um, what, we, what we learned from, from, I did a little short qualitative study on this as well and interviewed teachers and they did a questionnaire. And this was, this was a theme that came up, a lesson learned that it was so important to like, just have a toolkit ready, like have some, have some of these strategies that we've discussed 
ready to share um, and embed in lesson plans and to share with faculty and have a framework like whether it's the ICM model, the integrated curriculum model, where everybody's on the same page of what differentiation looks like, or even use the ABCs that we use in this, like advance the content, build the buy-in, create the challenge. That's our frame, where every lesson plan can kind of have something like that embedded. It's just a, it's a nice piece so that it's not the gifted ed teacher just coming in and doing something kind of entertaining and fun and challenging, but it's really grounded in something um, where everybody's on the same page and using the same language. That makes sense. That makes sense. I, I'm sorry we didn't get to all of the questions today. I, we just we ran out of time, as, as it always happens. I, I apologize. But if you have a question that you would like to have addressed, I know our, our presenters would be more than happy to, to correspond uh, by email. So I'm, I'm throwing up their, their email addresses there one last time. And if you'll, you can take a screenshot if you'd like to, to contact them. But let me, let me wrap this up and, and say, Stephanie and, and, and Vicki and Emily, thank you so much. You, you've been so generous with your time. Uh, I, I genuinely appreciate your participation in this. Thank you so much. So thank happy you. to be so here. Much. Thank and for you. all of and for all of you who attended, thank you so much. I know there's just so much going on right now with online learning and COVID and the fires and the hurricanes and the fact that you guys came out for this is I, I just so appreciate your your attention to this. Thank thank you so much and have a safe and, and happy week. Bye bye.